Thank you, Mark. See Thank you. you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. There we go. That's better. Good morning. My name is Mark Bristow. Uh, so I am the director of the Hunt and Incident Response Team at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Uh, that is part of the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center called the NCIC. All of these have acronyms because I'm the U.S. government and I'm required to make them into little tiny words. <laughs> so uh, I actually got my start in industrial control system security at the age of 11 years old. So when I was 11, my, uh, my father worked for a, one of the largest uh, control systems vendors, and he brought his 11-year-old son into the lab. One day, he was an engineer working on uh, PLCs, and uh, brought me into the lab and said, you know, on a Saturday, and sat me down in front of the console and just said, hey, play with the computer, right? I have work to do, but you know, you're interested in computers and start playing around with things. And in this particular lab, it was simulating a uh, petrochemical refining process, so turning dinosaurs into gasoline. And uh, I was playing on the computer, I played around for a little while, hit some buttons, and all of a sudden, all of the valves in the lab went open, right? This is what we call Texas explodes, <laughs> right? Uh, it was very bad. Even valves that were supposed to be closed were 100% wide open. So my dad goes over and said, what'd you do, son? I was like, well, I was just hitting buttons. And so uh, he closes off all the valves, resets the entire system. I do it again. And it took him four weeks to actually find the actual bug and get it corrected. So, uh, you know, if you can't defend yourself against an 11-year-old, we're in real trouble. <laughs> so <clears throat> this is something my lawyers make me put on my slides. So I'll just go right past that. So... <laughs> um, let me talk about a little bit about the NKIC. Uh, so there's a, a lot of kind of confusion, and I've already had the what happened to IC Assert conversation about four times. Uh, so I actually was originally in I IC Assert. I'm actually the person who registered the domain name for IC Assert, so I was there at the very beginning. Uh, but now uh, we've changed organization a little bit. I promise IC Assert hasn't gone away. And in fact, actually, from the incident response portion of ICS CERT, it actually changed over into my team, the Hunt and Incident Response team, a full year before anyone knew, but no one noticed. So I think that that's a win, uh, because we were able to transition that and still deliver the service that you all come to expect. Uh, but we're all now part of the NKIC. The NKIC in the United States is designed to help others do cybersecurity better. So we're not responsible for any particular system uh, or uh, defending any particular environment. I don't even defend the Department of Homeland Security's network. There's a sock for that, right? Our job is to help other organizations get better at cybersecurity. And so, and by doing that, we provide a whole bunch of different things that we do. Uh, instant response, obviously something near to me because that's the team that I run. But really, most of what we do is education, providing uh, guidance, recommendations. Uh, we do provide instant response services to those that, that got intruded upon. Uh, but we do this, we coordinate with a lot of uh, both uh, U.S. government partners, federal law enforcement. We are not law enforcement. Our entire focus is to help people get better. That is what we're focused on. We're not trying to catch the bad guys. Uh, but we do that by sharing information because this is a team sport, right? I don't think any one person in this entire room has everything that they need to do to, to know to secure our critical infrastructure. And so by sharing and working together, uh, it's really important that we do that. And I was honored last night to become a member of the Beer ISAC, finally, after years. I don't know where Patrick is. Yes. <laughs> but uh, I like to say uh, this is one of the most important aspects, right, is that we need to have open communication and talk to each other. Because if we don't, right, we're going to lose. The bad guys will beat us. But if we work together, it's a completely defendable environment. And that's really what we're striving to do. So I mentioned I'm at the Hunt and Incident Response Team, or the HURT Team. Uh, we did have another name. We thought about becoming the Hunt and Incident Response Organization, or the Heroes, but we thought that that was a little bit too cheeky. So we went with Hunt and Incident Response Team. Our job is to help federal, state, local governments, private sector, and critical infrastructure. That's basically the whole country that we are responsible for helping. Now, what a lot of people uh, get confused with her is that we are not your incident response team. We are there to help others do their incident response. So when we go and we support a customer, we might do so for a week or two, uh, maybe a month at tops, but we can't be there for everybody all the time. But what we are there for is if you have an emergency, if you have a problem, and we're going to go through in this, in this talk a number of uh, kind of case studies and control systems intrusions that we worked over the years, uh, you know, we are there to help. Right? And that is really what our focus and what our goal is, is to help 
primarily our critical infrastructure. We do most of our efforts securing uh, critical infrastructure uh, throughout the United States, and it's really a fun job. Uh, I've been at DHS since uh, 2008. Uh, I was a contractor, and then I became a federal employee in 2013. And despite my small federal salary, I stay because we get to actually make a difference in the world, and it's really actually a cool place to work. So uh, I also want to clear one thing up. A lot of people ask the question, well, what do you mean when you say hunt, right? And I'll tell you a little secret. Who's heard of incident response before? Raise your hands. Okay, most of you. Who's done or uh, knows what a hunt is enough that they'd be willing to get on the stage and explain it to everybody? Hey, look, no hands. Oh, I thought so, right? Let me tell you a little secret. A hunt is just incident response without the incident. If you're doing hunting correctly, right, you're looking for anomalies, right? We have a lot of focus on indicators of compromise, domain names, IP addresses, hashes, these types of things, and they are useful, but they're also really good for computers to look at. What you should be looking at as an analyst is looking for the anomalies, the weird things, right? The scariest thing that can happen to you during an incident response engagement is not bells and whistles going off and lights and sirens. That doesn't, that's not real life. That's the movies. Right? The, the scariest thing you can hear during an instant response is one of your analysts going, that's weird. Why is it doing that? Because it is that inquisitive nature and that questioning is what ultimately gets you down to the really interesting and unique cases. And so if you're doing instant response correctly and hunt correctly, it's really the same thing all the time. And that's why it's the same team, is because the same people focus on the same type of activities. It's just why you go that is different. In an instant response, you have something that brings you to the event. Maybe it's alert, maybe it's a suspicious user. Um, I actually had one case that I worked where it was a friend of mine that worked at a nuclear power plant, got a phishing email, and said, hey, can you just take a look at this? Right? I, I don't understand what this email is, it's suspicious. My bosses actually don't want me to tell the government about it, so like, can we just be friends and you just have a look at this for me? And so we did, and it turns out that this phishing email that, went, that I got from my friend was a PDF attachment from a nuclear uh, group that's coordinated by the US, United States government, and every nuclear power reactor in the United States actually received the same spear phishing email. All because one person looked at it, said this looked weird, sent it to a friend to do analysis, and we find out that every nuclear reactor was fished with, the, with something very similar. Right? And that's why information sharing is so important, and that's why it's so important to be inquisitive and ask questions about why things are working. So at Hurt, you can see, just to, to reiterate this point, it is the same process that we use. We use the exact same process for incident response as we do for Hunt. It, the same people work it, it's just the, the mechanisms of which they come are different. In incident response, we have some type of external stimulus that makes us actually go and do the incident response effort. With a Hunt, uh, it's somebody asks. And that's important. In the United States, we don't have uh, like NIS directive, et cetera. There are no uh, requirements for all of our critical infrastructure to do security. And working with the government is completely voluntary. So everyone that works with DHS on an instant response basis or really provide any of our services do so because they ask to do so. We don't force anyone to work with us. So by using the same process and pipeline for doing both hunts and incident response, we get much more effective results. For our team, we have a couple of different ways that we support people. So the one that we do the most is what we call remote response, or remote assistance. Remote assistance is where you can actually send artifacts, and this is true for the international community as well. Uh, we partner with pretty much every cert uh, in the world. And um, if you send us artifacts, log files, etc., we'll be happy to analyze them and give you, your, give you the data back our analysis. And that's what we do most of, right? We do, uh, I think we did three or 4,000 cases uh, last year across all things. So not all critical infrastructure, but we do a lot of remote assistance. We also have advisory deployments. This is uh, where we send people uh, to your facility when you've had a uh, big problem, but don't know how to handle it. So we're not doing technical work, we're kind of guiding you. We do this a lot for ransomware cases, because at the end of the day, there's not really much we can do about a ransomware intrusion. We'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to the case studies. 
We have remote deployments where we send out equipment, but not people. And then what everyone always loves to talk about, which is our on-site deployments. We actually have small flyaway teams, usually between five and eight people. We have equipment that we can bring to bear, uh, temporarily instrument uh, either a corporate network or a control systems network, and try and figure out what's going on in the environment. It's a very interesting uh, activity, usually there for about two weeks. Again, our goal is to bootstrap your incident response, not be your incident response team. So we will help you get started. But at the end of the day, everyone is responsible, at least in the United States, for their own security. So we can help you, but at the end of the day, it is your security, so it's your thing to actually finish out, complete, and remediate. But we will do everything we can to assist you uh, through that process. Okay, enough about where I work and what I do, right? Now it's time for the fun part that everyone came to hear. It's story time, <laughs> right? So we'll get into some of uh, my favorite industrial control systems case studies that uh, myself or my team have worked over the last, uh, I guess, 10 years or so. So to frame this, uh, I want to talk about the ICS kill chain. So it's really important to understand that there's a difference between uh, intrusion into IT and intrusion into OT. And I think that um, the, the team at SANS did a really good job in modifying the Lockheed Martin kill chain to make it more appropriate for industrial control systems. By show of hands, who's read the white paper on, on this already? About quarter, half of you. For those that did not raise your hand, I really do recommend you go to the link that's at the bottom of the slides and take a, a review of the paper. It's really well put together um, because control systems intrusions are different than regular IT intrusions. And one of the big differences is that really a control systems intrusion with physical impact and consequence, so an actual attack, uh, really is two intrusions, not one. The first one is a regular intrusion into a system. So you have a reconnaissance phase, you have weaponization, targeting, delivery, execution, command and control, and then ultimately actions on objectives. The difference is, is that if you're going after IT, usually that's where it stops, right? Most of our IT intrusions are interested in stealing information or uh, potentially uh, holding ransom, et cetera. You've made it when you do that. Now, when you go after a control system, that's just the beginning of your work. Because to have an effect in an industrial control system environment, you need to understand that control system, which means you need to sit in that control system for a long period of time in order to understand how it works so that you can build a weapon to actually impact that control system. The good news is, is we have very few case examples where we've actually seen this happen, but the cases are growing, and we'll talk about trends at the end of the presentation. But once you get there, that's on the blue side. The red side, that is where you actually have the impact in the control system. The time between those two sides, the red side and the blue side, might be days, hours, years, right? So we don't know how long the adversary will come and take the information before they actually use it. They may never want to actually use it. They may build a capability to use potentially in the future. So you may be sitting thinking that you're okay because you cleaned up the IT intrusion, but had sensitive information taken from your environment that ultimately is being built into a cyber weapon on the red side of the equation. So you will see this kill chain on every slide for every case study, and it will show you kind of what things were observed in the kill chain for this particular example. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. So I'm going to start out with the first case study, which is one that I feel is very much under-talked about. This is, uh, used to be one of the scariest things I've ever worked on, and I've done some stuff. But no one actually knows or talks about this case all that much, and that's why I always talk about it when I'm giving these types of presentations. So in 2012 in the United States, there were 23 different pipeline operators that were intruded upon. Now, in the U.S., when you're talking about transmission pipeline, 23 operators is basically the entire pipeline operation space. Adversaries tried to get into these pipelines using spear phishing, because everyone uses spear phishing, because it still works, right? They used spear phishing, they got into the corporate network. At no point did they touch the control systems network, or at least I can't prove that they did. But what's scary about this is that this is a stage one intrusion, so all blue boxes are lit up, but I don't know why they did it. So when they got in the corporate network, right, and I know we're here in a control system cybersecurity conference, Mark, why are you starting with a talk about an IT only intrusion? But if you look at what they stole from the corporate network, they stole lots of information about the control system. They literally searched every computer for SCAD star. Boy, I wonder what they were looking for, <laughs> right? It's nice when the bad guy telegraphs their intentions for you, right? 
But this, all this information that they took, and they took really interesting stuff like user manuals, personnel listing, dial-up phone numbers and passwords, right? How many people have a dial-up phone number monitoring solution deployed in their environment? I didn't think so, right? The best thing I've seen people come up with an IDS for this is, you know, call up the phone company and ask who's been dialing my modems. This is not a good way to do your intrusion detection, right? So that's a nice, easy backdoor directly into the control system process, right? They stole all this information, took all kinds of useful things about the control system from the corporate network, never touched the control system, and left. To this day, we do not know what the intention was of that other than they wanted to collect a whole bunch of control systems information. No idea if they're taking this information to build a capability, they just did reconnaissance, it was a research project, who knows, right? But it just demonstrates that even intrusions just into the corporate system can put your control system at risk. And that's why at DHS, one of the reasons why we fused the US CERT incident response team and the ICS CERT incident response team together is because you can't look at them individually. Right? How many people here have responsibility for securing control systems at an asset owner operator who actually owns something? A couple of you. How many of you know your counterpart in IT? Less hands, right? It's important that we look at this, these intrusions all the way through because it might be the IT side where we see the first indications that, it, that something is coming. And it, when it gets to the OT side, it may frankly be too late to respond. So it's very important that we are cooperating with the IT side uh, by doing that analysis. And we'll talk about some case studies where, th where that's happened. So the next one I want to talk about is commodity malware, right? I really still enjoy the nostalgia of dealing with conficker infections in 2018 because we still have them in our control systems. Uh, my favorite infection was where someone bought a brand new uh, in-wall HMI panel that they installed into their power plant, and it had Conficker installed in it, infected the entire network, <laughs> right? We still have this problem in control system security, and we probably will for a long time. And even though this stuff is not targeting ICS, it can still have impact. Ransomware is a great example. Ransomware is malware that is not designed or targeted for industrial control systems, but if all of your control system servers and HMIs are unusable, you can't actually run your process. And we probably get, I don't know, a call or a week, every week or so of somebody calling us up and saying, hey, we have ransomware in our environment, and you know, our control system process is completely crashed because we can't do anything. Can you help? And unfortunately, there's really not much you can actually do about ransomware. We, it, you know, Granted, everyone thinks the US government has all these capabilities. We do not have like a secret decoder for ransomware. I, I apologize. We're, <laughs> we, we haven't figured that one out. And so we still have these people that are impacted. Now, this is commodity malware that just made it on their control system, usually because things were unpatched, right? In fact, we actually recently did uh, in, uh, uh, a hunting operation where we found undetonated WannaCry malware on a transportation system computer. It ran a train system. It didn't detonate. We actually can't figure out why it didn't actually lock out the system. So they got really lucky, right? But it still got there because, of course, it's running on Windows XP and the system was unpatched, right? So this is still a problem that we have. And there's a number of cases in the news where you see, you know, control systems being shut down by ransomware. And I'll tell you at first, when looking at ransomware cases, I was a little casual about it because I'm like, it's just ransomware. You probably should have patched, right? But it can have real serious impacts into your environment. And if you don't have backups, you're in real trouble, right? Uh, unfortunately, the solution to ransomware is to build a time machine, go back in time, and start a backup program two years ago. Then you'll be okay, right? But unfortunately, if you've gotten hit by that ransomware, you know, it may be too late for that, and it's looking like you might have to rebuild your, rebuild your environment. But we do see that impact, and we have seen it hit control systems and actually shut down processes due to this type of commodity malware. The next case I want to talk about is a dam. So uh, in 2013, an Iranian actor actually went and accessed a dam in upstate New York. So this was a really interesting case. Uh, it made a lot of news in like the 2015 or 2016 timeframe because the United States government indicted uh, the uh, person behind this intrusion. No impact to the dam. And let me tell you, this was not a massive dam. This was not the Hoover Dam. It was a dam that if the Starship Enterprise came in and beamed the entire dam away, someone's feet might might get wet. A very tiny little small dam, right? But what was actually interesting about this case was that this dam was interacted with over OPC protocol. 
So this was one of the first cases that we had in the wild where we actually saw threat actors using control systems protocols to interact with the actual control systems environment. Because frankly, you don't even need to do that in most control systems to have impact. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But just showing some skill and, and uh, uh, control system awareness is something we don't have a lot of actors doing in 2013. Unfortunately, now in 2018, we see this much more commonly. We see a lot more interaction with control system protocols. But in 2013, it was still a pretty new concept. The good news was, even though this was not a particularly important dam, even if the dam, uh, the actor had tried to make controls, and they didn't. They didn't try and change the dam in any way, but they just did reconnaissance on it. But what they didn't know is that the dam was broken. So what happened was, is the, uh, the mayor of the town really wanted the dam at the ribbon cutting ceremony to move because, you know, I'm a mayor and it's a really impressive project and I want the dam to move while we're cutting the ribbon, right? An important politician. And uh, they were practicing for this, so they put the dam on the internet, right? And they connected it to uh, the internet using Wi-Fi and an iPad so they could control the dam from the dam site. And they were practicing it the day before the ribbon cutting and lo and behold, the dam, they starts to come up and it psh, breaks. Right, so the dam gets stuck in the tracks, and so they physically disconnected the dam from power, so you couldn't actually move it with a control system because it was broken, and you could damage the dam. So even if the, uh, the Iranian actor in this case had, uh, had tried to do anything to the dam, could not have done so. But the control system didn't show that. So they still interacted with it. It was still kind of interesting. Uh, again, not really sure why this dam was targeted. Uh, it was available on Shodan, so that could be the reason. Uh, but uh, an interesting case nonetheless. Moving on to black energy. So black energy, a lot of people talk about black energy. Black energy is not specifically control systems malware, um, but we, have, we did work a series of cases uh, in the 2013-2014 uh, timeframe where black energy was being delivered in a very interesting way. So we, I know we talk a lot about in control systems about patching and make sure we have a patching program, and that is really important. Uh, but this is one of the cases where we actually had zero day vulnerabilities in three different control systems products being used to deliver malware. So while Black Energy itself doesn't actually have control system specific protocol payloads, what it, does, it did use was those zero days to actually get the initial infection onto the system. This is one of the few times we've actually seen in the wild again where zero day vulnerabilities were actually used uh, to deliver malware. What was really interesting about this is it even looked like it was automated in some cases. So we actually had one case where there was a control systems HMI directly connected to the internet that was infected with three different versions of black energy at the exact same time. Which if you think about that is actually really impressive software development capability. Because could you imagine three versions of Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel running on your computer at the same time? I'm pretty sure it would blow up. Right? But they had three versions of black energy running on the same system. So again, this automated delivery of malware, very interesting. Again, what was the end goal is not actually clear. But there was a lot of really weird control systems. We had some energy systems. There was a trash system that actually was impacted. Because who's going to attack your trash? <laughs> right? And my favorite was a very large university in the United States elevator control system was infected with black energy. Why? Why is your elevator control system connected to the internet, number one? And number two, why is it infected with black energy malware? Very interesting. Uh, but again, all stage one intrusion, right? No actual impact. No uh, observed actual changes to the processes we're, we're seeing. Move on to Ukraine. So, you, you know, there's two things you like kind of are required to talk about in a presentation on control system security. You have to mention Stuxnet. So there's your Stuxnet reference. I'm not going to talk about it again. And you have to talk about Ukraine. <laughs> Right? So Ukraine, though, is a really interesting case study for a couple of reasons. The first reason is in the 2015 attack, a lot of people, when we're talking about control system security, get really focused on, oh, well, we have to look at the serial communications and we have to understand the voltages going into the IO blocks on the RTUs, and this is how we're going to detect instant response. So Ukraine in 2015 was the first actual cyber attack where there was physical consequence that we ever saw against civilian infrastructure. Okay, so this is the first time where people, the general population, were impacted, right? 225,000 customers approximately were impacted. If you convert that to population, there was about 2% of the population of Ukraine had their lights go off. Let me tell you something. If 2% of the United States of America had their lights go off, which is about 60, 60 million people, they would be losing their minds, right? In Ukraine, uh, I was actually part of the U.S. government team that went over to Ukraine to, to, at the Ukrainian government's request to investigate this. And uh, I asked everybody there, I said, you know, well, what was the impact? Like, what happened? And they're like, there was no impact. 
Well, well, why? Well, because the power goes out in Ukraine all the time, <laughs> right? We don't put anything important on the power grid, right? So in some other countries, especially my country, that's not the case. We put a lot of really important things and just assume that electric power is working. Anyone from the electric power industry? Well, then all of you know that every time you turn on the light in the morning, a small miracle has occurred, right? <laughs> because these, these, these systems are very complicated, right? But still, we were able to actually have impact on the control system, but the impact wasn't caused by the malware. At the end of the day, all they did was take over the screen and the mouse and the keyboard of the operator HMIs and click breakers to turn off uh, the power, right? A lot of times we focus on these very low level attacks and in control systems, but in reality, if you wanna have impact in a control system environment, you don't need all those really cool hacker skills, right? The, fundamentally, the intrusion that happened in Ukraine in 2015 is something you learn in the first day of penetration testing class, right? If you can use Metasploit, compromise a computer, and use v VNC DLL inject, you too can do the 2015 Ukraine attack, right? So something that we don't focus on a lot with industrial control system security, but is important, right? We focus a lot on the end, uh, end field devices, but really some of the other kind of Windows computers in there can be where we actually have our impact. So fast forward to 2016, now we have another attack on Ukraine. This time, a lot less impact, restoration in about 30 minutes, only a single substation was impacted. But if you look at the differences in tactics between the first Ukraine incident and the second Ukraine incident, wholly different in, uh, attack, right? In 2015, you're talking about remote driving computers, again, Hacker 101. In 2016, you have a, basically a cyber weapon designed to destabilize power grids. Right, that's where you have the, cro the crash override malware was used. In this one, we actually don't know how crash override was delivered to the system. So if you look at the kill chain at the bottom, right, you have the 2015 attack, you have the whole kill chain. Right? You have the reconnaissance phase, go through, there was a six month dwell time, and ultimately have impact in the, on the system. In 2016, we don't know how it got there, so all the blue stuff is, is blank, but we have the impact, right? And frankly, I am surprised, based on the capabilities of the malware, that it was only limited to one substation. Uh, that uh, the crash override is potentially wormable. It can self-discover different modules. It can actually go out and find different uh, control systems equipment without human interaction. Uh, I think the Ukrainians got lucky in 2016, to be completely, completely honest with you, because the capability set difference between 2015 and 2016 was massive. Right? A lot of work was done between those two intrusions, and it just you know, shows a trend that you know, our adversaries are getting better and better at actually interacting with industrial control systems. So something we need to be looking out for in the future. Another one of my kind of favorite case studies is Havex. I really love this case study because people like myself and probably most of you have spent a lot of our time preaching to people that, hey, we need to patch our control systems, patch your control systems, patch your control systems. Well, this is one of the examples where if you had followed the best practices, you might have patched yourself with malware, right? If you're not familiar with this set of intrusions, uh, Havoc's malware is delivered, again, a lot of different ways, had some control system specific modules. But what was really interesting about it was in some cases, the adversary went on the internet, compromised a vendor website, downloaded patches from the vendor website, put the patches back with malware infected in it, and let you go in and patch yourself with the malware. Now, if you're looking at a Ukraine-style attack, where you actually have somebody who has to work through the corporate network and go through the DMZ, steal passwords, do all this work to land in the control system, if I infect your patches, I land right in the control system, I don't have to do any work. It's a beautiful, very artful way to actually get your malware where you want it to be. Right? Make, the, make the good guy do the work of the bad guy for them. Right? A different spin on supply chain. When we talk about supply chain, we all think in our minds things like the alleged Bloomberg story, right? with the little chips and people intercepting motherboards in, in the mail and all this kind of stuff. And that's really not where we should be focused. We should be focused on our vendor security. How are our partners securing their systems? Because if we can't uh, trust what we get from our partners or our vendors who are supposed to be delivering us security updates and patches, right? we have a problem in our fundamental security model. And I think that Havex is a really great example of how that kind of trust and partnerships uh, can be exploited. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next case study. So this is a case study that uh, kept us busy last year. Um, this is where uh, in uh, 2017, 
We had uh, Russian government actors that were trying to hack into the U.S. power system. Uh, they were not particularly successful, so that's good, right? Um, but uh, we actually ended up having to do quite a bit of work to work with our private sector in order to help secure this. So what happened here was, again, not from a control systems intrusion perspective. There's no control system specific malware. They didn't use uh, anything that was destructive, but basically fundamentally just stole usernames and passwords using some interesting techniques. So in uh, a lot of cases, they sent uh, phishing emails to HR people with uh, Microsoft Word document attachments that looked like control systems resumes. So a lot of people go, well, why, you know, you're uh, not supposed to, we've all had our phishing training. You're not supposed to open attachments from people you don't know, right? Well, what is HR's job? To open attachments from people they don't know, <laughs> right? Job applicants come in all the time. So all they did was basically use a feature of Microsoft Word that allowed them to re include a remote document template that would exfil the password hash and username of the user that was logged in. This was enough to then crack that password and then ultimately log in with single factor authentication via the VPN and get into the system. And from there, reconnaissance could continue. So this targeted a lot of different sectors, uh, but it wasn't just going after the energy sector. And in fact, actually most of the victims weren't in energy, right? That appeared to be the end goal. And in uh, at least one case, we actually do have evidence that they actually made it onto the industrial control systems network. We actually have a screenshot that was reconstructed from a RDP session that the actor was doing, which actually show the, uh, the actual HMI that they were uh, interacting with. But we could tell from the way that they moved through the environment, there were other cases where they were trying to go after control systems information. So again, sometimes the adversary will telegraph what their intentions are, just like we talked about in the 2012 pipeline intrusions. So if you want to look at who was targeted in this, uh, and if you want more details on this, uh, the very last presentation of the event is uh, John Homer from my team is going to be presenting an in-depth on this case study. So if you want to learn more, go to his talk. He'll get into a lot more of the details. But what's really important about what you see on this bullseye is that even though energy sector was what they were going after, most of the victims weren't in energy sector. So this is just a slice of the activity that we saw. But if you look, they targeted people who work with energy sector companies, right? So in one case, they actually took over the mail server of a construction company and used that construction company to send out a whole bunch of phishing emails to the energy companies. You might ask yourself, well, why do they want to do this? Well, they were exploiting trust models, not computer trust, but human trust, right? I like to say, you know, cybersecurity is really not a technology problem. We sort of actually know how to solve most of the things in uh, cybersecurity. The problem is actually with the humans, right? There is a trust model there. So what they were doing by targeting these vendors was these are people that these energy companies did business with. They built substations for them. They built facilities for them. They were contractors for them. So when they couldn't get into their primary targets, they went after these secondary softer targets and were able to then leverage that trust relationship because, hey, I already know this guy. So I'm going to go ahead and open that attachment, right? And all of our training tells us that that's okay. So they're just exploiting what we've been trained to do. Because a lot of times we're incentivizing the negative, right? We are always punishing people for opening attachments. Oh, you shouldn't have done that, right? You shouldn't have clicked that link. You should have known better, right? I think our model needs to inverse. We need to actually promote people doing the right things. I actually know of a company that... Um, put together a program where basically if you report a phishing email successfully to their automated phishing program, you get a like $5 bonus, right? It's amazing what $5 will do to motivate people to identify phishing emails, where if you yell at them, they th it's adversarial and they're concerned and they're worried about their job, but you give them a little tiny bit of money and all of a sudden their the reports of phishing email on this company went sky high, right? Because everyone's trying to get that, that little bonus, right? Give me a free cup of coffee, right? So, by incentivizing that and kind of that distrust model, right, that's the type of thing that we need to be focused on because at the end of the day, our people are our greatest asset and our weakest link, right? They're the ones that are going to identify the weirdness, the anomalies, but they're also going to be the ones that ultimately enable the attack. Does anyone do, do penetration testing in the room? A couple of you who are willing to admit it anyway. Has anyone failed at a phishing campaign ever? Failed to get access? Oh, you have. Yeah, you fail, you, you can't get anybody to click the links. Yeah, just keep trying, right? It's really easy to do phishing, right? 
So when I was doing penetration testing, uh, my, one of my favorite things to do is back when the iPhone first came out, my favorite thing to do was to send a phishing email that basically said, hey, uh, this is IT. Uh, we uh, are going to do this pilot program with the iPhone on the corporate network. So uh, first people, 20 people to sign up here, log in. Uh, we'll get you signed up for an iPhone. And if we don't continue the pilot, you get to keep the iPhone anyway. My click rate was over 100%. People were forwarding it to their friends that I was not targeting because they wanted their friends to get the iPhone. So I got more than the people I asked for, right? So there's, it's very easy to trick people, but we ask our defenders too often to be the security people. That is our job, right? We need to make sure that it's okay for them to make mistakes and use them as assets as opposed to having adversarial relationships. Because exploiting trust, like the, uh, the Russians did in this campaign, exploiting this trust is easy and it's just how people operate. So, Again, something we need to consider. And the last case that I'll get into is Triton, Trisis, or Hatman. Yes, we had to come up with our own name at DHS. It's a really funny story about why that is. Happy to explain it to you over beers. <laughs> um, before I said in the, in the first case study that the pipeline intrusion was the scariest thing I worked on, because I don't know why. In this case, uh, Triton recently took that because this malware is designed to hurt people. So those of us that have been working in the control system space, for, security space for a while, know that it's possible to cause human harm with a control system. It's always been possible. We have uh, tons of accidents. They happen all the time by accident, right? But this is the first time that we actually saw malware that was designed to hurt people. And this is a scary place because once you have this kind of malware out there, while we all knew you could do it and it was theoretical, now we actually have case studies and examples where it's being leveraged out in the wild. And now we've kind of moved into a dangerous phase, in my opinion. And I, I make a prediction on Twitter every year that this year will be the year that we have a confirmed fatality due to an industrial control system security incident. And I'm going to make that prediction every year until I'm right. And you know what? Well, you know, it's, it's October now, so uh, maybe I won't be right this year. Uh, but it's getting close. Because if you look at the trend and kind of the, the overall trend of this entire set of case studies, you see, we start out with poking around in the corporate network. We're doing uh, some reconnaissance, starting to build maturity and control systems intrusions. You see the adversaries really upping their game. And now we actually have kind of the crown jewels of our most critical processes being directly intruded upon. And frankly, from, uh, you know, DHS did not respond to this incident, uh, but from everything that we've seen on this, frankly, the adversary made a mistake. They attempted to disable the safety system in a way that was transparent to the operator where they would have thought that the safety system was working, but it was not. But because of that little tiny mistake, it actually, the safety system did its job and got very confused and shut the entire process down, which is exactly what it's supposed to do. But had they not made a mistake in their malware, that could have actually enabled a much more consequential action that could have eventually hurt people, right? So if you look at this as from a, a capability of actor perspective, we see it steadily going up the chain, right? Rudimentary intrusions in Ukraine one year, the next year, high capability control systems malware. Now we have safety systems malware out there in the wild. So unfortunately, I think that uh, you know, things are getting worse from an adversarial perspective. All is not lost though. So uh, a year or so ago, we took a look at a whole bunch of our incident response cases over time. And I asked all my analysts, I said, look, if you could pick one thing that would actually fix this problem, what would it be? And what they did is they came up with those one things and we looked at root cause analysis and picked one mitigation that actually would have saved the day if you could only do one thing. And the results were actually a little surprising. Application whitelisting actually became the number one thing. I thought it was gonna be remote access and connectivity because a lot of times we have lots of connections into our environment, right? But that was actually the last one. Most of the stuff we have could have been fixed by blocking code that we don't expect to actually run in our systems, right? And actually that's one of my poll questions is uh, that I put forward for the polls is who's actually deploying application whitelisting? Does anyone just quick show of hands? We've got one, two, three, four, uh, like, okay, I'll go with like 10 or 15, maybe 5% of the audience, right? This is one control that in IT is miserable to deploy. It is really hard to put application whitelisting in the IT network, but in control systems, it's actually easier 
because we have the ability to actually catalog all the things we need to know. Because in control systems, we don't have as many users running around who, oh, I need to go on Facebook, or I need, the twi- you know, I need TweetDeck installed, or all these kinds of, you know, I need iTunes to run. No, you don't. You don't need iTunes on your HMI, right? You know, that's what your corporate computer is for, or your personal phone, right? So this is actually a control that is not very well implemented, but would have solved a lot of the problem. Is anyone surprised by what's on this slide? Has anyone never heard of these terms? Nobody. And that's kind of my point, is that at the end of the day, from a technology perspective, these are things we know how to do, we know how to implement. Part of the problem is doing it, getting them funds to do it, right? Articulating why it's important, right? And that's why, and what I'll kind of close with with my kind of final takeaways to take back to your leadership or for your leadership in your organization, it's incumbent upon you to lead the change. Uh, I was at a security conference uh, last week where uh, the main, uh, the keynote speaker did a whole bunch of things about phone hacking and actually before the conference ran around the conference with a video camera and went to see how many phones he could touch with no one noticing. And there were a lot. And I'll tell you after his talk, if you looked around at all the tables, everyone took their phones, right? It's important to be the change we want to see in the world, right? And understand it starts with people. It is not a technical problem. It is a, it is a people problem. We need to work with our people in order to be effective. We need to lead that change and make sure that they understand why that change is important. A thing that's really important, I think, for control system security is tied to safety. Everyone in control systems understands safety. I, I, I posit that you cannot have a safe system if you do not have a secure system. Can't guarantee safety without security. Right? So start talking in words they understand. Have preparation. You gotta understand what you need to do, right? And incentivize those positive outcomes, right? Don't always focus on the bad stuff. Focus on the good stuff. And the last thing I'll leave you with is we spend too much time looking at IP addresses and domain names. Start looking at tactics, right? Some of the things that frustrates people about the, uh, the Triton malware is that really there's no IP addresses to see. It's a framework. Right? You need to look at the tactics you use to deliver the malware and see if you can detect that in your environment. Don't look for the specific thing the adversary did because it's too easy to change. Right? By doing this, we start to look at anomalies and now we're always hunting and we can actually be successful in our control systems defense. And with that, I've got a few minutes left. Happy to entertain your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very oh. much. <laughs> thank you very oh, much, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah, we have a question and answer session right now. We have some interesting questions okay. for you already. Great. So, so if you're ready, I'd like to, to ask. Ready as I'll ever be. Ask away. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'd like to start with this one. Um, how do you know Russians were behind those attacks on the U.S. energy sector? So, um, I will say this: the United States government does not make public attribution lightly. So if we were not confident in our assessment, we would not have been saying it. Right, okay. <laughs> Fair enough, <laughs> I guess. Um, all right, so let's, let's move on to another one. So um, this one is interesting. Um, you mentioned, uh, sorry, uh, where do you get your data for your hunts as you do not have uh, operative responsibilities? Yeah, so that's actually a really interesting question. So one of the challenges about doing hunts is, again, understanding what the, what the baseline looks like. So uh, what our teams have done over time is figured out ways to be very fast at understanding what normal looks like in the environment. Mm -hmm. But we can't do it by ourselves, especially because it's not our network, right? So we work very, very closely with the people we're supporting to say, hey, is this normal? And I'll give you an example. Um, I was doing work at an energy company, uh, and they had this application that our malware analysis platform was certain was malware. Mm -hmm. It It was absolutely a score like 99 out of 100, totally malware. In reality, it was actually a PDF that had been converted into an application using a conversion tool that did scheduling for vacations, right? (laughs) So it's really important to understand the context of the environment you're in. We don't have that context, but the people that we work with do. And part of our job uh, at DHS is not just to do the hunts, but also explain and demonstrate the methodologies that we do our hunt so that the people that we're helping know how to do this for themselves and can do it all the time. Because I cannot be everywhere for everybody. I'm a right. you know, reasonably small team, limited resources, 
But you know, we want to try and educate them on how to do, look for those types of anomalous things. Sure. So, so if I understand you correctly, you don't really have sources where you look for for known bad or things like that, or or uh, emerging threats. You you rather go into and look at what should be the normal state yeah. and work from there. Don't get me wrong. We do that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we take as much open source information. Mm -hmm. Yo, know, one benefit of being the U.S. government is I have the U.S. intelligence community available to support me. So we will do lots of stuff to get that information to look for the known bad, but. Frankly, the known bad is less interesting. Yeah. It's looking for the weird. That's where I have the analyst focus. Yes, yeah, that makes sense. So one, uh, we have more uh, time for more questions, so, so let's go for this one. Uh, would it be applicable to re-weaponize the identified malware to use against attackers? Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> so, uh, no. No? <laughs> uh, flat no. Um, there's a lot of talk about hack back. And I know that that makes people feel good, I guess, but um, you can't get your stuff back, right? Uh, trying to hack the attackers is not a, a, a good strategy. In fact, it may just anger the attackers more, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. We actually, in defense, have the upper hand, right? In war, they always talk about the terrain, having, you know, choosing the field of battle. The attacker has to come into our field of battle. We own the terrain, and we actually have the strategic advantage. Going after them in their place means we've lost that strategic advantage. Oh, yeah, sure. Our challenge is that we're not using our advantages enough, right? To an attacker, if you intrude upon a system, you get a little black box, right? Uh, if, you, if you pop a shell on a computer, right? But we have transparency in the network, or at least the opportunity to do so. But one of the things on that, that slide was monitoring. A lot of control systems and corporate networks, frankly, don't have sufficient monitoring. So when the weird stuff happens, they don't know because they don't see. Yeah, of course. And if we do more of that, monitoring telemetry, we have better opportunities to d defend the bad guy. It, oh, yeah. I'd rather spend money on monitoring than fancy hackback tools. Sure. But yeah, but it, I mean, it wouldn't be too surprising for us that it's not U.S. citizens to, to um, imagine that you would uh, share information with, for example, NSA Tao. So. Well, so, I mean, understand that we, like, the idea is that Yo, defense is collective. And don't get me wrong, offense informs defense and defense informs offense. If you've never actually hacked into a computer, you don't understand what the limitations are for how it feels to hack in a computer, right? So I, I fall on my pen testing experience often about kind of how would an adversary approach this problem, and, and that's important. But really, uh, one of the reasons I got out of penetration testing is, is frankly, it was getting too easy to get into power plants. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of getting depressed. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, it's a lot more hard, it's a lot more interesting challenge to actually defend the environment. And, but you do need to talk to the people who are doing offense in order to do your defense better and understand how they would yeah. approach a problem. Right, so, so uh, let's go with a few more questions here. Um, are you really sure no fatalities already occurred because the ICS attacks? Sorry, I, what was that? Are you really sure no fatalities already occurred because of ICS attacks? So, uh, you'll note I used a lot of uh, lawyer words in that statement. Um, so, a confirmed fatality. My Mark Bristow's personal opinion, not representing the opinion of the United States government, it's probably happened already, but we don't know. Because a lot of, again, going back to the monitoring problem, a lot of times we don't have enough data to actually identify root cause. So, we often publish statistics, and the number one statistic of root cause is unknown. And that's mm. almost always because we don't have the data we need to actually figure out how did this start. So, uh, you know, you could have a safety incident that you think is just safety related. And frankly, most of the time, I'm sure it is just an accident. But if you don't have the data to actually investigate whether or not it was, there was a cyber cause, you'll never know. And so I, that's why I make the prediction with those kind of caveats is that I think it probably has actually happened, most likely by accident. No. But uh, we don't have the data to actually prove it yet. Right. And one year we will. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, I guess that's true. So, so that leads to the next question here. Uh, if there are no malicious activities detected on an affected system, could that not be a foothold for the, to be used in the future? Would it make sense to monitor the malware to identify real intentions? So you can do that. And there is a, uh, there is a, 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 a tension between the desire to fix and the desire to monitor. Mm -hmm. And that is a tension that everybody who runs a system has to come to their own conclusion about what's appropriate. You definitely need to understand when doing an incident response or defense, you need to understand enough about what happens to ensure that you actually got the adversary out of the environment. Yes. So you do, you know, a lot of people go to, oh, well, we'll just replace the computer re-image. If you don't do some level of monitoring, you don't understand the problem enough, 
in order to make sure that you got the bad guy out of the network. But at the same time, you don't want to leave a bad guy in there that is potentially going to cause harm. And that's actually where things like the kill chain really help. Because you can see, if, you're, if you think you're in the stage two of the kill chain on the red side, uh, you, know, you probably want to fix it immediately. But if the adversary is just doing reconnaissance and has that initial toehold, it might be valuable to monitor their activities for a little mm. while. Maybe they're somewhere else that you haven't seen yet. It's really just a trade-off that you have to make on a case-by-case -case basis. Sure, okay, thank you. Uh, so I have a follow-up on that. Uh, yeah. Could it be possible that in the Ukraine uh, example, for example, yeah. that the crash override malware for 2016 was actually dormant from an injection made in 2015? I mean, it's possible. Uh, I did not do the forensics work on that, no. so uh, I can't say what, 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 did what did or did not happen. Uh, but it is possible that, you know, it's... Likely that that, you know, if you look at the compile times of the malware and that kind of thing, it's likely that it was installed reasonably quickly. And it actually brings an important point that when it comes to the actual red side of the kill chain, the difference between being in the middle and being in the red can be milliseconds, mm -hmm. right? So you don't actually know when that malware is going to get delivered and executed. But right. it is totally possible it was sitting dormant. It was also possible it was delivered five minutes before the attack yeah. occurred. Without the appropriate forensics information, mm -hmm. we're not going to know. Right, okay. So thank you very much, Mark Bristow. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you.